Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Hello and welcome to you all. Happy Monday to you. Happy day after Palm Sunday. For those who observe, welcome to another edition of Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. It is Monday, March 25th, just after one o'clock Eastern. And I won't go through the whole time zone uh, rigmarole, but I hope you know where it is wherever you are. If not, you should probably seek help, but do it after the show. Enjoy the next uh, 45 minutes or so first. I want to talk a little bit later on about not the great carbon tax revolt per se. We, we spent a lot of time last week and the week before that on that subject. But I, I do want to speak a little bit about how the federal government is still not exactly owning up to how long it's going to continue to increase the carbon tax. We know it's going to keep going up until 2030. Uh, this weekend, the uh, Environment Minister, Stephen Gilbo, did an interview and he said, oh, the government hasn't really decided beyond that. Now, I, I realize there's a lot of optimism in that on the part of the Liberals that they think they'll be in power in 2030, when at this point uh, they don't even know if they'll be in power in 2026. But this is a bit of an interesting dilemma in that on one hand, we have a government that is so ideologically committed, so hell-bent on the carbon tax, it doesn't even quite know how long it wants to continue to ramp that up. Uh, the most uh, imminent increase is the one coming into effect on April 1st. And I was seeing on uh, Twitter, or X as they call it now, on social media this morning, there are a lot of these rallies that are being planned across the country in places like Lloydminster, Alberta slash Saskatchewan. I don't know which side of the border it's on. In Ottawa, in Cochrane, in a town in uh, Ontario, Pickering. Like I, I like Pickering. It's a nice place, but I've never known it to be the hotbed of any particular protest. So all over the country, people are going to be demonstrating on April 1st. Now, of course, by this time, it is too little too late. The increase will be in effect. The government has been under unflinching and unrepentant so far, but it will show the growing dismay. So uh, we will talk about that later on in the program here. But let me just first off uh, talk about the elites saying the quiet part out loud. Now, I've been talking on this show for, I don't know, probably years, but certainly for the last few weeks about Bill C-63. This is the Liberal government's so-called online harms bill, a piece of legislation that the Liberals have this ha have just decided to believe is the panacea for online discourse. Now, the problem is that they're trying to rein in and curb online discussion. They're doing this under the guise of the what we would call speech they don't like speech they don't like is really what they're trying to avoid. But they have to come up with all of these ways to deal with that, to make that justifiable. And what they do is they say it is, uh, oh, what do we call it? It's hate speech. Oh, it's a speech that is hateful. Well, they are the ones who get to decide what hate is. And I have lamented that in the past when this issue has arisen, you had this, this stable of people that was a, I, I would say, an unflinching defender of free speech. People that weren't just ideologically conservatives. You had uh, principled liberals that, like Jerry Grafstein, the former liberal senator, was an absolute firebrand when it came to defending free speech. People like Norm Macdonald at CBC. No, not Norm Macdonald, Neil Macdonald, Norm Macdonald's brother. I, I prefer Norm Macdonald to Neil Macdonald for many, many, many reasons. And I'm sad that Norm Macdonald is no longer with us. But no, Neil Macdonald at CBC used to be quite critical of censorship. But all of these people at a certain point just shut up and they decided to go along with it. They decided to go along with the state's censorious impulses. And uh, what I want to share with you today is a piece that I came across in the Globe and Mail, uh, an, a column by Lawrence Martin, who is the Global and Mail's uh, public affairs columnist. You can see the headline there, excessive free speech is a breeding ground for more Trumps. Now, sometimes, here's a little secret of journalism and media. The, the writers generally do not write their own headlines. Certainly at newspapers, the writers don't write their headlines. So if you ever come across a sensationalist headline that doesn't quite match what's in the story, that's why. It's a headline written by an editor that didn't actually read the story. But this one, the headline really does match the substance of the column. He talks about uh, all of these uh, cases where uh, there have been battles between different state governments and social media and all of that before he gets to the real point that there is a tsunami of free expression 
that he links to the arrival of the internet and social media platforms. He says, despite the grumblings we still hear about the lack of free speech, these platforms gave more of it to the masses than anything ever before. He says, printing presses, radio, television, they were controlled by elites. You had regulatory bodies like the CRTC in Canada. Uh, But basically, people can say whatever they want online. They can talk. We have a tsunami of free speech. And here's where he starts talking about the view he holds of the little people. The masses were, were finally weaponized. Not with arms but with a communications instrument that empowered them against establishment forces like they had never been empowered before. He says, oh, what a wonderful democratic advance it was, but, well, there's always a but with these folks, but it came with a rather massive irony. Free speech became as much a slayer of democracy as an enabler. He says, unchecked free speech means there's raw sewage in the public square, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, polarization, child pornography, threats, bigotry, conspiracy claptrap. That's effectively a direct quote. And he says, Trump's rise wouldn't have been possible without the internet. So ultimately his argument here is that we can't have free speech because it yields a political outcome that he dislikes. In fact, what he calls for very explicitly to reverse this trend is rigid regulation. But he says, oh, the free speech lobby in the United States is as fierce as the gun lobby. So Lawrence Martin believes that we need rigid regulation of speech and how terrible it is that you have a free speech lobby. Again, someone committed to upholding the fundamental right to speak your mind is just part of some evil, scary lobby group like the NRA. That's the comparison he draws. So because you might use your free speech in a way that he disagrees with, free speech itself is the problem. Now, this is the ivory tower mentality that is being embraced and adopted increasingly by the elites who are invested very heavily in your censorship. Because again, to talk about saying the quiet part out loud, It's because we have Twitter, because I have this podcast, because you have the ability to engage with content as you so choose, that people like Lawrence Martin are increasingly irrelevant to people, that his voice in the Globe and Mail is no longer the forced, it no longer has the forced relevance because it's just one of a small handful of voices that people can access in the establishment media. So when people like that talk about being threatened by free speech, you should very much pay attention to them because they're talking about this because they do not want to have free speech for their own selfish reasons. They want to be the gatekeepers on opinion. They want to be the arbiters of what you can and can't say, what you can and can't think. And heaven forbid the plebs enjoy free speech. They might vote for Donald Trump or, oh, maybe Pierre Polyev or, oh, maybe they might oust Emmanuel Macron and France. I mean, who cares? The point of free speech is that you have just as much a right to push back against that. Free speech gave Joe Biden the ability to campaign against Donald Trump. Free speech is what's giving Justin Trudeau the ability to defend his record. When people talk about free speech as being the problem, what they're actually saying is that they don't believe their arguments will win. They don't believe that when push comes to shove, their free speech will be as effective as their opponent's free speech because on a certain level, they know they are wrong. So you can take your censorship and you can shove it. And if you can find room wherever you shoved it, you can put that copy of the Globe and Mail up there as well. My goodness. We are going to uh, talk about this, I'm sure, in more detail as the defenders of Bill C-63 come out of the woodwork. But I do want to talk about MP pensions for a a little bit here because this has been an incredible, incredible display of brazenness. So we have in Canada, you may not realize it because we've had a, a string of minority governments, But in Canada, we have a fixed election date and it's fixed in statute. It's supposed to happen every four years. Now, obviously, the government can dissolve parliament at any point as it sees fit and we can have an election. Opposition members of parliament could, of course, go to uh, band together and take down the government with a motion of non-confidence. The Conservatives tried to do that last week, but as predicted, it was defeated when the Bloc, NDP and Liberals all maintained their confidence in the government. But all things being equal, if there's no non-confidence motion, there's no snap election by the Liberals, we have a fixed election date, which means that we know it's coming. And our fixed election date right now is on the books for October 2025. Now, I didn't give a specific date there because this is subject to change. 
Currently, the law says the election will be October 20th, 2025, but the Liberals are tabling an amendment to this that will push that date to October 27th. It will push it back seven days. And you may think, okay, what's the big deal? I don't even know what I'm doing for dinner tonight, let alone what I'm doing in October of 2025. Well, why it matters is you have to look at the motivation. Why is the Liberal government changing this? Well, the Liberals say, and it's not untrue, by the way, that October 20th is the date of Diwali. Now, Diwali is the Hindu festival of lights. It's a very popular and very big celebration in the Hindu community, a large enough group in Canada. Having this election on that holiday would be disruptive. We move elections around for Jewish holidays and Christian holidays. So that in and of itself is not inherently unbelievable, but they could move it a week earlier. They could move it two weeks earlier. They chose to move it a week later. Now, something happens between October 20th, 2025 and October 27th, 2025. Something happens in that span of seven days. And what you may ask, well, that's a fantastic question. What happens is dozens more MPs become eligible for their gold-plated taxpayer-funded pensions. Ah, yes, now it starts to become clear. Well, no offense to the Hindus in our audience, no offense to observers of Diwali, but I suspect your holiday has been less of an incentive for MPs to delay the election by one week than this little detail about pensions has been. And this is where we get into, I mean, what's the old Shakespearean line? Aye, there's the rub. Well, uh, right here you have, and uh, Canadian Taxpayers Federation and National Post both uh, crunched the numbers on this, you have to, to be eligible for your MP pension, have six years of pensionable service. Now, I was actually a little bit confused by this, and I, I spent much of my morning uh, poring over legislation. So uh, you'll forgive me if I have a glazed over look in my eyes. I haven't like ripped the glaze off from reading legislation. For It's not from donuts, it's from reading legislation. But what happened is we saw that you needed six years of pensionable service. Now, I didn't actually know how they calculated that because MPs are elected on election day, but they're often not sworn in for several weeks after that, maybe even more than a month. Does pensionable service begin when you are elected or when you are sworn in? I would have assumed when you're sworn in because that is when your work begins. And similarly, when parliament dissolves, you cease to be a member of parliament. So do you stop amassing pensionable service time when parliament's dissolved or on the election date if you lose. Now, as it happens, it goes from election to election. So even though you're not even serving as a member of parliament for a good chunk of either end of that, you're actually amassing pension credit in that time period. Which means that, yes, six years, the amount of time it takes to qualify for your pension, six years is actually a threshold that dozens of MPs will cross between October 20th, 2025 and October 27th, 2025. Now, the MPs we're talking about are the ones who were elected in the 2019 election. Now, uh, the elephant in the room here, most of those MPs were conservatives because this was the election in which the Liberals, which had a majority government from 2011 or from 2015 to 2019, were knocked down to a minority. The Conservatives elected a, a couple of dozen more MPs. The Liberals elected some new ones as well. The Bloc Québécois, the NDP, there were lots of new faces. Conservatives have most of this, but not all of it. And why this is relevant is because you have here, I think in a lot of the cases, MPs that, look, the Conservatives aren't the ones changing the legislation. The Conservatives are the ones uh, that are just there. The Liberals are the ones steering this ship. But you have Liberals that are motivated, uh, perhaps by realizing that they're not going to get much pushback from MPs that are retiring, are going to lose. I mean, right now, all the polling is showing the Conservatives are on track to win a supermajority which means that Liberals, NDP, and Bloc MPs all stand to lose a little bit in the next election. So the MPs that were first elected in 2019 are getting very nervous right now. They don't want to lose their pensions. And you better believe, I think they care more about that than they care about Diwali. Chris Sims is the Alberta Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation and joins me on the line now. Look, Chris, CTF has always been sounding the alarm about MP pensions. These things are absolute sweetheart deals. MPs get 
a better pension than pretty much anyone in the private sector in this country. Yes. Right? But the, the more insidious part is how you know that they make decisions based on eligibility. Like I, I, I know people make the criticism and no one can prove what's in someone's mind, but I'm convinced that Jagmeet Singh is motivated by his own pension eligibility in terms of keeping the government alive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we don't want to, you know, dance around this. Uh, we put out the news release. Uh, Franco Terrazano and his team there in Ottawa did an immense amount of work calculating these potential pensions. And again, this is the upper limit, right? It's the parameter that if all of them lost their seats, which is highly unlikely, this is how much the taxpayers would be on the hook for. So that's the mathematical part. But we we have to notice the forest along with the trees here. And of course, this would play into somebody's decision whether or not they want to, say, continue to support the Trudeau government. If they're going to be lined up for a big pension in just a few more days, why not just hang in there? There are very few members of parliament who've been able to withstand that temptation. Credit where it's due. Uh, the former prime minister, Stephen Harper, took a big hit on his personal mm -hmm. pension. I can't remember how much money it was, but it was big time, like seven figures, something like that, over his lifetime for his pension. So there are some members of parliament who do walk the talk and they are in it for pension reform, but they're pretty few and far between. Yeah, and I'll give those numbers you just alluded to mm -hmm. that Franco crunched here. So there are 80 members of parliament who will become eligible in that week, who will, be, will become eligible on October 21st, 2025, 80 of them. Now, of those, I think it's about 30 or 33 that were conservative. So uh, most of them, I, very few conservatives are, are saying they're not running again. A handful are. So most of them, given these polling numbers, are probably going to be staying around. But even if you look at the 50, of liberals yeah. that aren't running again or will lose, NDPers who are, aren't running again or will lose, Bloc Québécois. Uh, these are all folks that will amass collectively tens of millions of dollars just by moving that election one week. Yeah, exactly. And imagine that temptation. And so again, folks need to remember uh, that quite a, the member of parliament will start getting a pension once they reach a certain age. And then you just do the basic calculation from there. You decide, you know, how long are they going to live past then? Sorry to be grim, but that's what we have to do with mathematics and calculations. It's not personal. You know, are they going to live to 80, 85, 90? And then you go through all the different numbers of MPs and that's how you do this math. And so I think that's why it's really important that Franco put out this piece this morning. So yes, we understand the politics and the chess match that is happening right now. But we also understand the math and the cost to taxpayers behind it. I think I just saw before we jumped on here, did the opposition leader Pierre Polyev call this bluff and say that no, let's move it up even earlier. So we don't run in to the religious ceremony and festival, but you're still not hitting the pension date. I think I saw that. Yeah, I I'm, I'm guess I'm just a little bit, well, <laughs> take a step back. What, how do you think that plays out? Have to see, right? So <laughs> this is it. So, okay, taking off my CTF hat a little bit here. Uh, I was on Parliament Hill working there through a couple of different political blowups, you'd call it. So I remember when suddenly the Canadian Alliance, a lot of people within the Canadian Alliance lost faith in their leader Stockwell Day. And a lot of party stalwarts got up and left and they went and sat by themselves. I remember when Belinda Stronach, who actually ran for party leader, it's not like she was just some random no-name backbencher, when she dramatically crossed the floor, when we all got to see Peter McKay with his dog in his potato field. Like, politics sometimes isn't boring. My point of all of this is, is before that happened, everything seemed fine. So on the surface, the duck is cool and calm and collected, but underneath the surface, they're just going like this. And so everything's fine until it suddenly isn't. And so the same way that we saw the carbon tax vote, getting all of those members of parliament on the record, yay or nay, are you for or against the carbon tax increase? That was pressure. And I think if I can just put on my hat a little bit here, I think that's what they're doing with this. He's calling a bluff. It's kind of a gangster move. And he's going to try to get everybody on the record whether or not they want to move the vote day. And so again, that's more pressure that's increasing on this hull. And so I, th I think that's why they're doing that.
Yeah, and and again, I I, I gave my little civics one. Candace Malcolm <laughs> always calls me the in-house political scientist because I just have a tendency to take all of these like salacious political topics and just frame them in the most boring technical terms possible. But I, I've said at any time there could be an election, so we're not bound by this, but. That supply and confidence agreement with the NDP and the Liberals has been pretty ironclad so far. I mean, Justin Trudeau, I, I'm convinced, and you and I have spoken about this before, that he's a burn it all down on the way out kind of prime minister. I actually don't think he cares about his MPs' pensions. I think that he wants to just pick the moment that's going to be best for him. And if uh, it, it you know costs a few dozen Liberal MPs their pensions, so be it. I don't think he cares. But I, I do think it says a lot about the entitlement mentality, you, entitlement mentality you see in the House of Commons and you see among MPs. And look, I, I'm not going to say conservatives are immune. I mean, there were a no. lot of these these fire breathing reformers that were elected in the 90s and then alliance candidates in, in 2001 that were big crusaders against this sort of stuff, but then benefited from it the second they were in the door. They sure did. And a lot of them were part of a majority government. And we didn't see a lot of dramatic reform. Again, credit where it's due, we did see some. Some folks are pretty stickler or sticklers to their principles. And so we did see some. But no, this has got nothing to do with the color of the jersey. This has got everything to do with power and money. And in this case, those who are currently holding on to power are in line for an awful lot of money for the rest of their lives. If only they move this little election date up just a little bit further. And so we'd be naive, we'd be silly to think that this does not play a role here. You you mentioned uh, Prime Minister Trudeau in this sense, and this is where I wanted to bring it back to political mm. activism and peaceful grassroots activism. I was describing all the pressure these MPs are under, and we're seeing that with polls, right? We're seeing that with these votes. Another element for real is the pressure they're getting from constituents. And it's not just coming from Taxpayers Federation writers, but a lot of it is. If they keep getting this pressure from their constituents, right? So they're, they're middle bencher and back bencher MP. If they're getting a call from Mary and Joseph and Sahil from their, from their constituencies saying, Hey, man, I can barely afford this. I can't pay my hydro bill. I can't fill up my minivan and take my kids to school. I'm voting against you until you, unless you smarten up. That really rings bells with these MPs. And what I'm hearing some scuttlebutt from Parliament Hill is that apparently, I don't know if this is true, apparently the prime minister is tuning out of his caucus more mm. than he has before. And this has been a pretty late development. And regardless of political party, once a leader starts doing that and tuning out the people who are part of his team, if that's happening, things start getting bumpy. And so this is, again, why I would encourage people. And I would say the same thing if it was another party that was screwing you over on your taxes and trying to take your money. Um, this is why it's important to keep up the pressure right now. Right now. Continue. Yeah, to and, and we... The we, we had heard something to that effect when the Liberals had their caucus retreat in London, which I only know of through other reporting, because as we uh, perhaps recall, I was banned from covering it, even though it was, you know, like five minutes from my house or whatever. Were you but, kicked out of the city or did you were you allowed to stay in? Were you? Banned? No, I was, I was allowed to maintain my residency in London. They, did, they didn't go full uh, like G20 on me and like shit me fine. out. They didn't give me the old David Menzies and drive me out to the outskirts and dump me in a parking lot or anything. But uh, they, they did uh, say, you know, you're, you're not welcome here. And that's fine, but the, well, it's not fine, but I'm just moving on to what I wanted to say here, which was that we, we heard that liberal MPs were quite frustrated with the status quo in their party. And again, how they have been so silent. I, I mean, hurting conservatives is very, very, very difficult. I mean, Stephen Harper was probably the best at it. And even he had a lot of trouble with caucus members that were just a little bit rambunctious. Hurting liberal, they, they are a conformist people. They fall in line. He has kept that caucus tight. There has only really been one criticism of him that uh, is by someone who's still in that caucus. And that was a, a no-name Quebec MP. Others, like the second there's a bit of dissent, they're out the door. Jody, uh, Jane uh, Philpott, Jody Wilson-Raybould, uh, Selena Cesar Chavez. And as a result, everyone else just shuts up. Yes. Until recently. And until the carbon tax, which is mm -hmm. again why I think this this pressure is so important. And I keep coming back to it. I know we're geeking out here politically speaking, but the fact that the Atlantic caucus of the Liberal Party said, hey, Trudeau, we're not going to be paying this carbon tax here, boy. 
like all of our constituents are really mad at us who we've been hearing at it hearing about it over the summer and again i have family there i lived there okay I, I know the culture all of those little gatherings over the summer they they still call them box socials i'm not kidding and the picnics and all that stuff they would have been hearing from a lot of their hardcore liberal party supporters in atlantic canada and they got an earful and they turned around and gave prime minister trudeau an earful and magic he carves out a carbon tax exemption for their primary home heating fuel, which of course is oil. So for him to blink on that showed that there is a division within that caucus, that he will cave to pressure, and he had to admit that the carbon tax is a financial burden to people. So that was a major move. And the fact that the environment minister, Stephen Guibault, was not at that meeting, I think that's the crack in the armor. So we, I would encourage everybody just go at that and, and put pressure on that Fisher. We, we have a, a super chat from Marco here. He says, why is everybody against the liberals? They made my house the best asset I have. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're one of those uh, wealthy homeowners just uh, because the, the, of inflation and all of that stuff. Uh, you, you mentioned Stephen Gilbo, Chris. Let me play this clip of, uh, well, let, let's just let the clip for, speak for itself here. The plan, that, plan, rather, that your government laid out post-2019, uh, the 2019 election, got us to 2030 and the targets that, that you set out to 2030, and that is when the price on carbon will reach $170 a ton. Uh, do you intend for that price to continue to go up, since you do see this as such an integral part of your climate policy, beyond 2030 to help Canada reach its 2050 target? So we haven't made a decision on that. Uh, we've started consultation to prepare the next phase of emission reduction, so post-2030 uh, in Canada, in fact, going to, to 2035. Those consultations are, are, are ongoing. Um, we, Canada will need to make a determination by next year, as per our United Nations commitment, to, to, to set those, those new targets for, for 2035. Uh, we will need to do that by by next year, by by 2025. There's no decision that has been that has been made yet, other than we will continue increasing the price on pollution. Oh, we don't yet know. Again, a lot of things here that are important to caveat, such as are the Liberals going to be in power in 2030? I don't know. I mean, theoretically, even if they lose in 2025, they could be back in, in 2030. Yep. Crazy things happen. I, I do love the uh, profound uh, irony here of him giving a lecture on global warming. Well, he's like puffed up like the blueberry girl in Willy Wonka. Like he's like, like basically he's on the verge of just taking off off the ground. He's so puffy while talking about how we need to tax more because it's so warm warm outside. Yeah, it's late March and you're uh, basically Jigglypuff there with your big giant parka. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, what do you make of that? that the, I mean, literally, this is an infinite carbon tax and an infinitely increasing carbon tax to Stephen Gale. Yeah, I was noticing his downfilled, likely downfilled parka there too. Uh, it looks pretty chilly. Uh, I would bring us back to the former environment minister. So Catherine McKenna famously before an election said they had no plans to increase their carbon tax past $30 a ton. Remember that feels like it should be like with old timey music and like sepia tone. Right. Um, and then magic, as soon as the election was over, up it went and they announced it to $170 a ton. So folks, regardless of political party, again, I hate to break this to people, but I think I need to because we're getting some feedback of, oh, well, look at the rebates. Look at the rebates. You're richer for it. Politicians sometimes don't tell the truth. They do this so often that we have a mascot for them that looks a lot like that Italian fable of the wooden boy who couldn't tell the truth and his nose kept growing. So they do this. And so for him to say, oh, well, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, wait and see. So I think in this case, you just need to look back at his previous work history and his current behavior as environment minister and sh will they continue to increase the price the carbon tax or the price on carbon or whatever they want to call it you know is water wet of course they will like of course they will the only thing that would stop them i think is a strong rebuke from their own constituents Again, we would have to crack through that fissure of influence, I think, and get through to those members of parliament and get those members of parliament to convince their prime minister to change his ways on this, to say, hey, people are broke. They can't afford anything yeah. anymore. We have to, you know, call a spade a spade and do a full retreat on this. I'm always an optimist. I actually think that that risk is not zero. I do think the politicians do change their mind when they realize their own job is on the line. This could happen.
because the NDP in British Columbia used to rail against the carbon tax. And now they love it that they're in government. The mm -hmm. NDP here in Alberta imposed a carbon tax on Albertans without warning. And now most of their political candidates. Oh, yeah. They're all scrambling to see who can oppose it the most. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So just, you know, if you don't like the politics, wait five minutes. Right. So I do still think that there's a chance of that. But we need to keep that clip because we need to remember what Gibo said there in the future. All right. And if you are missing any feathers from your duvet, uh, check Stephen Gilbo's jacket. Uh, all right. <laughs> Chris Sims, Alberta Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Always a pleasure. We uh, Well, we won't see you next Monday because it's Easter Monday, but we'll, uh, we'll make it up somehow. Thanks so much. Have a happy Easter. Bye-bye. All right. And to yourself as well. Uh, this, yeah, that way, I'm sorry. I, I don't, I'm not making fun. Well, I guess I'm sort of making fun. Yeah, no, I'm making fun of the coat. Okay, never mind. He looks very warm. That's all I'm saying. And I don't think it's climate change that is letting him feel that warm. I think it's the jacket because he's uh, standing out in the Alberta cold in late March or the Quebec cold in late March. I actually don't know where he is. I, I don't care anymore either. But all right, we will shift gears here. There was a bit of a development on the Freedom Convoy legal front last week. Now, I've been speaking on this show periodically about the seemingly never-ending trial of Tamara Leach and Chris Barber. They went on trial supposedly for 13 days in September, but it is now the end of March and their trial is still underway, although it's not every day. It's, it's on and off. They'll do a couple days at a time and, and whatnot. But uh, it is easy to uh, forget that there are other cases that have a lot less publicity around them, but are still stemming from those same three weeks in Ottawa. Now, one of those came to uh, a bit of an end, at least to some extent last week. It was the trial of Jason Vanderweer, Jay Vanderweer as he goes by. Uh, he was one of the participants in the Freedom Convoy protest. Now, one of his contributions, uh, and I, I only learned this after the fact, but let, let's put up the cover of, of my book on the convoy. Uh, so this is the Freedom Convoy, the inside story of three weeks that shook the world. Pardon the shameless plug, but the you can see there's a shed on the back of that one truck there. That shed was actually a rather uh, pivotal role uh, in the convoy. It was a multimedia studio. It was live streaming. It was doing all of that. And uh, there, there's a connection between that shed and the man I wanted to speak about in this particular segment. Now, uh, David Anbert joins me. He is a, a criminal lawyer, very prominent uh, commentator on Twitter as well. And he was the legal representative of Mr. Vanderweer. Uh, David, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Uh, now, now I, I should just say, I actually testified in this trial, just by, by way of disclosure, and my testimony was uh, effectively my own experiences and things that I saw as a journalist covering this. But, but let me ask you what happened last week. What was the judge's finding here? So at, at, after the trial, you testified, you were, I think, on day two of what was ultimately a four-day trial. Um, there were different sort of pieces to the puzzle that came together, uh, different uh, testimony about the beginning, the middle, the end of the convoy. And ultimately, uh, we made arguments that a mischief had not been made out. Uh, certainly, Jason's participation in a mischief had not been made out. And even if it had been made out in the alternative, we argued that there were two sections of the criminal code uh, that permitted either one to act with color of right or one to act in the course of delivering a message. And uh, I, I argued that the evidence uh, certainly established that that's what uh, the convoyers were engaged in doing. Uh, the judge rejected all four of our arguments uh, and ultimately found the Crown had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a mischief, that Jason was uh, was involved in it to the requisite level of attracting criminal guilt, and he did not find that there was color of right uh, or that the uh, other section applied. So he found uh, Jason guilty, and, and now the case, uh, I mean, it's you said brought to a conclusion it still has one more step is mm -hmm. uh, because he has now been found guilty regardless of what you think about that the court has found him guilty and as a result there will be a sentence that's going to be imposed uh he will have of course have, have the chance to appeal and that's something that he is looking into doing 
What is this? I mean, mischief was something that a lot of people who are not criminal lawyers had really first heard in the context of the convoy. And I know it's not a new charge, but what actually is mischief in a criminal sense? And how does that apply to the Freedom Convoy, where we've heard it come up both in uh, Jason's right. case and also the cases of Tamara Leach and, and Chris Barber and others? Right. Um, okay. So mischief, we most commonly see it in criminal law involving the destruction of property. You know, if you get in an argument with someone, um, and let's say they, I don't know, they film, they want to record you on their phone and you don't like that. So you grab the phone from their hand and smash it into the ground. That could be mischief or punching a hole in the wall could be considered mischief. But if you go in and read the section, there are other ways in which a mischief can be uh, committed. And one of the well-established ones is by interfering with the lawful enjoyment of property. And I think that was the angle that the Crown came at this from, uh, that, that they actually had two counts that basically slightly different, with slightly different wording said the same thing. One said that it, it, it basically interfered with the lawful enjoyment of the property, Wellington, Parliament Hill, uh, the downtown area. And that also it in, interfered with the citizens of Ottawa's lawful enjoyment of the property. And so, I mean, he was found guilty of both, but because they're so closely related, he can only be sentenced on one of them. Effectively, the conduct that leads to one inextricably leads to the other. And so he's only going to get sentenced on one of those counts on which he was found guilty. And so what, what is meant by interfering with the lawful enjoyment is that it, it was the Crown's theory that people could not enjoy the public property uh, downtown Ottawa, that roads could not be traveled, that good night sleeps could not be had because of the constant honking, um, that there was the inability to, uh, to access certain roads. Uh, and what's interesting about this trial compared to maybe some of the more high profile trials like you talked about the Tamara Leach trial is the crown actually led very little evidence in this particular case. I mean, in fact, it led so little evidence. A judge even said that if it wasn't for the evidence, both of the defense, but I mean, we, we, we wouldn't have called that evidence if they also didn't have some in their case. And the judge also pointed to the fact that Mr. Vanderweer had posted videos on social media himself. If it wasn't for that evidence, there would have been, there would have been really no evidence of what the actual mischief was. Um, I mean, again, like the defense had to call the evidence because the Crown would have and did call the evidence of that Jason had posted. And so without any response, the, the conviction would have almost been been certain, at least on this judge's analysis of, of the law. And so we argued that they didn't really prove they didn't really prove uh, the mischief. And in fact, one thing that was actually interesting was you may recall there was a video montage that I put to you mm -hmm. about um, some misinformation that went on uh, during the convoy to such an extent that that numerous members of parliament and the NDP and the Liberal Party kept talking about this arson case, arson. They kept repeating this, this lie that, that the convoyers had been involved in arson. I put that to you and there was actually a, a point where the judge intervened and we had to address this in your absence, uh, where the judge was suggesting to me that I was essentially, you know, putting up a straw man that no one was suggesting that anyone was engaged in arson. But my response to the judge was that one of the reasons we we're trying to put this forward is that the Crown in other cases has asked the court to take judicial notice to accept without hearing evidence certain facts, such as the fact that Ottawa was occupied or Ottawa was the subject of, of this large scale mischief where people couldn't get to their homes or couldn't sleep at night without even hearing evidence of people saying those things. And I explained to the judge that whenever, if the Crown were to approach him, uh, approach the court and ask the court to take judicial notice, or even if the Crown wanted to ask the court just to draw inferences about the convoy, that the court should be very guarded to do so because of the prevalence of misinformation. That's what that evidence sought to establish. And I thought that that, that was clear to the judge. Um, one comment he made, which is gonna be interesting to look at if this matter goes to appeal, is that in, resp in response to one of my arguments, 
the judge made the comment that said you'd have to be living under a rock to not be aware of the intrusion that this caused. And that's exactly what judicial notice is, that we don't necessarily have to hear evidence of it, that everybody knows that this is what happens. And that that's the type of of finding that the court shouldn't have been able to make. And so certainly that's something we're going to look at when deciding whether or not to appeal. Um, well, just, in the to end, jump, just to sorry, jump in on that point, David, because one of the problems here is that you do have in a lot of these cases that I, I've seen come up, a case where Crown is putting the convoy itself on trial right. and applying that to the person who happens to be the defendant. And and it it really happens irrespective of the individual defendant's conduct. And it sounds like that was really what was happening here as well. Well, to a certain degree, that is a an effective and an appropriate strategy of the Crown. And to a certain degree, that was our strategy to combat it. I mean, the Crown would need, if the Crown wants to go that route, they have to establish that the convoy itself constituted a mischief and also that the person on trial participated in some way that they just weren't simply observing it happen in front of them, but they were in some way acting either as a principal actor in that convoy or as a participant or, or as a aider or a better of, of the convoy as a party to, uh, to that. And so, um, we actually liked framing it like that because if we could establish either of those two had, had had failed to be done, that would have resulted in an acquittal. So our primary line of focus is to argue, look, the, the Crown is not established beyond a reasonable doubt, certainly not on the evidence in this trial, that there was a mischief. Um, and to whatever extent that there was, um, the convoy was there to um, to deliver a message and so under subsection seven of the mischief provision, you can't find someone guilty of that. And then even if that was established, they had to establish that Jason participated. And I think the judge was able to make that leap in the, in the sense that they found him to be a, a, a fairly involved participant in the convoy. So let me just ask you moving forward here, uh, not just in, in this case, but in general, now that a, a judge has found that someone who was involved in the convoy had committed mischief. That's the finding as it stands right now. Can that seep into other cases when Crown is making similar arguments? For example, the Tamara Leach and Chris Barber trial, which is already underway. Can they use this ruling to kind of help make that case against them that, oh, a judge has already found the convoy was a mischief? In theory, it, it shouldn't. I mean, and the, the main reason why is that um, every criminal trial is a trial on its own evidence, other than when a court takes judicial notice. Like, mm -hmm. like just, to, just to reiterate that point, you know, a court can take judicial notice that water freezes at, at zero degrees without having to call a scientist into court to testify in every case where that's, where that's a situation. There is um, a place for that process, you're saying. Pardon me? There's a place for that process of taking judicial notice. Right. I'm saying there are ways in which judicial notice can be taken. I mean, judicial notice can be taken of the fact that that Wellington is, is located north of the Queensway and that, and that Metcalf Street runs north south. I mean, these are things where everybody does, in fact, know this. There's no controversy. Any any resources like maps or anything like that would would confirm that. And so where there's no dispute, courts can find that. But in a, to answer your question, on the extent of whether or not something is a mischief, the court needs to adjudicate it on the record that's before it, on the evidence that's before it. And, and so I think that it would be inappropriate for a court to, um, to find that because one court found it to be a mischief, another court could do that as well. All right. Well, uh, sorry about the loss, but I, I know you're looking at your options and, and let's hope that uh, we have some sanity prevailing here. David Anberg, criminal lawyer in Ottawa and not a Simpsons character, as for uh, quite a while, his uh, Twitter uh, profile photo made it seem. David, good to talk to you. Thanks, yes, for, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for having me. And also thanks again for your testimony in the in the trial. It was it was quite well received. Well, always happy to, to talk about things I, I saw and observed there. So appreciate that very much, David. And we will uh, end things in a moment. But just since we're talking about the post-COVID era here, I'd be remiss to not talk about this. I've never seen the show Yellowstone. I see the ads for it. I think it's on Amazon Prime or something. And I think Kevin Costner, no, I was going to say Kevin Spacey. He's not in anything now. Kevin Costner, I think, is in it. Uh, but there's another guy who's in it who is, uh, let's see, 
Uh, my my show notes here. I don't even have the name of the guy. Um, how do how do we have the story on? Oh, there we go. Forey J Smith. Uh, apparently his name. Forey J Smith. He. Uh, well, let's just hear what he has to say for himself. Like I just got kicked off a plane in uh, where the hell am I at? Uh, Houston, Texas, because I asked, told them that I didn't feel comfortable sitting next to somebody with a mask on. Yeah, I've been drinking. I've been sitting in the airport for three hours. Yeah, I'm drinking. I ain't drunk. But they throw me off the plane because I'm drunk. Because you people won't stand up and tell everybody what it this is. I just told them I didn't feel comfortable about sitting next to somebody that had to wear a mask. And I'm off the plane. Uh, that, I never heard of the guy, but I don't even, so I don't even know if he's any good on Yellowstone, but I like him for that alone. His, his best performance is his post plane ejection confessional about not feeling comfortable sitting beside someone wearing a mask. All right. Uh, a little bit of a lighter fare for you as we end the day here. We will be back tomorrow in just uh, 23 hours and 15 minutes here on Canada's most irreverent talk show. Thank you. God bless. And good day to you all. Thanks for listening to the Andrew Lawton show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.